Thanks for coming along. Thanks for watching the film. Um, we now have a few questions with Richard and James Hankins, the director of the film. Uh, and then we're going to throw it open to the audience. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. So, first question first, Richard. How did the collaboration come about? So, did you hear about what James was doing and then seek him out? Or well, hello. Uh, hello. Um, James, I've met James a few times over the years uh, when we played with, uh, when I played at Bristol and I played here. Yeah, James often loomed up. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in Northumberland, in uh, Newbiggin, was uh, actually uh, Steve Malley does a project with the horse and it's named after. Uh, when you walk in the room from the pub in the mist, the sea fog, and just suddenly a horse will move out of the fog towards you. That's how I met James. Uh, and, and the last time was at the uh, end, of, end of the road when I, I was watching the uh, trying to listen to Shirley Collins' set, and then James. Appeared and was there. Basically, annoyed you. It was so nice. And, uh, and then I, I'd watched some of his work on mine before, any, anyhow. And then me and John, uh, Hugh Butchers, I don't think he's coming to the school later. Uh, he, he, he's my manager. And then um, we were talking about who like, uh, would be the right person. And, we just kept coming back to James just because his work is so thorough. Um, I never pronounced thorough like that. <laughs> uh, it's just like really, really, you could see the, the, the amount of passion put into his work. And then I knew he was a really nice guy as well. And then his response to what we sent through was, was really on the nose. And so, how did that work then, James? Did you get. Did you get sent a completed song, or did you get sent a demo? Or? Yeah, no, I got the full album, and um, no, yeah, the song first, and obviously it's a lot to take in, yeah. the first listen, you're like, well John said, like, do you want to do a Richard Dawson video, and I was like, of course, yeah, definitely, it's like, it's 40 minutes long, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, quite something, and I was like, yeah, send that over, it's fine, and it, it was a challenge, like, it's an exciting challenge, but, you know, like, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, but also saying that is a challenge, but it, I mean, it all, the ideas came very quickly because I just heard, even just that first 10 minutes, and I kind of got a sense of like, even before Richard and I talked about the themes and things, that like, it felt like watching people from the past or watching people doing things yeah. and stuff like that. So I got a sense of like, sort of craft and, and like, um, I don't know, I heard a bit more from Richard about what the album was about and the song was about. So, yeah. So how close was the collaboration then? Were you left to your own devices pretty much or were you in constant contact with Richard about what you were filming or how was that working? Pretty much. Like we didn't really talk that much about it. Yeah. Which, like I don't know, sometimes you, yeah. It it worked well I thought. You kinda of just told me to key things. I went away, had a thing, and then bought like sort of just came up with some ideas of things, and Richard seemed to be into most of them. I think there's only thing you did. Oh, I did ask Richard to milk a cow, and he didn't want to do that. That's understandable. No, actually, the email replies, everything's fine, I'm not milking a cow. That's good though, because I've just. You've so done so many. I'm so sick of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were some other things, that, uh, but for me, it was just like. I don't, you know, I find, like the last time, I've always tried to make the videos over the years, or at least make the first couple, and, uh, and then I did some really in-depth ones for Hannah Glenn, uh, particularly on the edit, and it was really hard, and I just,
just thought with, with 2020, I just like handed over a basic idea to Edwin Burdes, um, who did job in and I was so pleased with the results that I was like, oh, well, this is good, I just need to, it's just a case of finding the right person and uh, just giving a few seeds to and then Really just allowing yourself to sort of yeah. devolve, devolve responsibility. Yeah, and it's, it's really, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's, really, uh, it's really important, I think, for me that there's this uh, gap. Yeah. This video is something else. Uh, and I don't, I almost want it to, it, it has to help deliver the album in a way, but it also can't be it. Some, sometimes they they really intertwine these things, and I think I want to keep them apart. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that we had some fun Zoom editing sessions towards the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, a lot of fun. We're like, it was buffering, <laughs> so we were doing it on Zoom, like just at the same time, like sending an export and yeah. then feedback. And, but everything was buffering, so I think it was the most ridiculous thing. Richard was watching it, but not in the proper way. Yeah. And we both, there's, I, I took a screenshot of Richard, who was having things. So that was much less for the end, but I mean, like, it was fun. So. No, it's so nice of me, but I just felt bad for James. <laughs> so, like, good. I'm interested in sort of how you go about interpreting um, the sort of thing that you got sent because, like, Rich's lyrics are like startlingly imagistic at points. They're, they're literal is the wrong word, but the imagery is incredibly strong. So, if you're given a line like, um, I step into a slipper pair, exquisite replicas of those worn by Ada, enchantress of numbers. Mm. How do you respond? Just ignore it. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I, just, I love his lyrics so much, and I, did, I knew that I couldn't do anything with them to do them justice. So I just thought the best thing is actually... So I didn't read the lyrics, had them through, but I didn't actually read them. So and I always get lyrics wrong anyway when I'm listening yeah. to music. So I kind of... And I wasn't even thinking of... I was just thinking of mood and the feel of it and the flow of it we talked about similar kind of things we liked so I knew how it had to be in that way and then didn't really worry about it and then it was only like when I was putting the subtitles on that afterwards I was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it worked and sometimes it's like ooh interesting like combination of picture and play. Um, but, um, but yeah I'm, so I think there's no way I could ever try and it would have been crazy to try and sort of show what yeah. was happening in you know, Richard's song. But you're looking to sort of maintain attention in that case, aren't you? You're looking for the... You're not looking to explain too much what's actually happening or mm. to, to literally interpret what's going on. You're looking to find an image that sort of balances with the music and with the lyrics in that Yeah. Oh, so. well, just it's like milk and orange juice. You, know, you get that oaty, oaty stuff that's made mm. when you mix the two. <laughs> or like uh, trying to eat a bowl of soup whilst watching the football. So there's a, a sort of big theme in the that seems to be in your album as well, and that definitely comes across in the video is the it's the sort of way that fantasy is in, is is intruding or intrudes on the quotidian or everyday life. The way it sort of things seem to push, we seem to push ourselves between those states quite naturally these days in some respects. Like there's lots of references in the video to things like video games. Um, fantasy narratives, like quest narratives. Yeah. Like, is that something that, like, that relates to the album as a whole, I think? Yeah, yeah I mean, it was, I, I guess I was writing the lyrics in lockdown, and it was a, there was loads of stories about how people were, and the news were about, you know, people were really gravitating in a bigger way than ever to, to more video games. Um, and then the whole social media side of things, I was thinking about, like, there was this, uh, all of the business with Trump and his campaign and the, the kind of, I can't remember the name of the Russian politician, but they kind of borrowed these techniques of fake news and so we're suddenly in this very foggy, uh, difficult to, it's difficult to really know anything now, yeah. for sure. Um, and I, I really like playing games myself as well. It's, I, don't, I don't play them all the time, but some ones are really, Mm. Rapids now and again. Yeah. Um, so all of this was sort of floating around. But then I started to feel like actually some of the, we were chatting about it backstage, like sometimes these, it's 
not just necessarily a game, but like a, a book or a film or football, punch a punch of tree, uh, friendships we all have. We're, we're using fantasy all the time as a means to to grasp life a bit more. And actually, when you talk about like the real world now, to me feels completely like more surreal and bonkers than this. Uh, I was reading the Earth Sea or yeah. playing Skyrim. This world feels completely nuts. <laughs> like difficult to grasp any kind of. Because that that comes across in the video. The the idea I think of like. It's, it's just as much reality intruding into fantasy as it is fantasy intruding into reality now. There doesn't seem to be, a, 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 you get the sense in the video that the two are equally spaced. You know, there's no one is given more importance than the other in a lot of respects. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it's a, yeah, like we did, I we didn't want it to be like um, clear exactly what was um, uh, a game in there or a dream or or real, just a sort of, you know, Rich and I have talked before, like, just like the timeline mangling and sort of, like, you're not quite sure what came first and where, you know, just a mess. I just like, I like playing around with um, that kind of thing, so it's really exciting. Richard's album is kind of about that and sort of how you perceive time and timelines. So, like, that's exciting to then sort of do some random stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Basically, the idea of the, the, the sort of random connectedness of the images and the music <laughs> yeah. as well, and the timelines are all yeah. in a different I guess, Yeah, like I've got my version of what that is, so like I can sort of think, you know, think of this, what happened in what order, mm. and then, um, but, but it's best not to. Yeah, just let it go. It's like the, the Reddit interview with you recently, Richard, where you said there's, like, there's no hard edge. Yeah, that, that, that's not the way that you're looking at the album, I presume, in the video as well. That it doesn't have like a linear, like a quest narrative, there's no mm -hmm. edge to it. Something that feels almost, you said it's like billowing out. It's, it's yeah, very interesting. Well, I guess almost like, um, right, I know this part of the song where this could have a very um, coherent story for me, but there's certain parts where I know what's happening character but the character doesn't necessarily know what's happening to them. So how would they even begin to describe that? I was thinking maybe about just off the top of my head an example of a film like The Master mm. where it's more it feels like a really realistic film to me, more so than most films, because it you almost experience it like a dream. Like how we experience things with there's not hard edges to our day, the events of our day, uh, or how we feel about things is rarely <coughs> crisp, mm. although maybe now with this more social media binary, we have to have an opinion, sometimes it can be this crisp or at least an illusion of that. Mm. Um, so, but it, so it's really important that I know what's going on in the, for these people. Um, but then maybe the language is, is, is quite obscuring because what's happening in the person's mind is, is obscuring. And yeah, it's necessary, it doesn't have that edge that reflects on the view of the other scene. It's, it's necessary that it's obscured slightly in that way. Yeah, I think so. And, and oh, I think really? As well as like um, parts, uh, you know, maybe suggest some. I'll put it like, I remember the first time I played Skyrim was about 12 years ago, something around this, and it was, that was the best Christmas I ever had. <laughs> two, two weeks, a very lonely time. <laughs> and the fact that I, that's what I did for my Christmas is a bit sad, but the actual experience was... <laughs> uh, but I remember when I, when I started the game and I, I go into the forest and I can literally look around and, okay, so where, what, where do I go? The my the housemate, well, you can go anywhere. Oh, okay, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. You know, like a, to, a, down the path, and like, you can go anywhere. And this uh, feeling of there being 
so many avenues I've not going to be able to take. It was almost like a overwhelming, like, I'm going to have to make a decision. We all feel that in life sometimes, like, oh, God, I've got four decent options and seven bad ones. Which one shall I pick? It's probably going to be a bad one, isn't it? But, uh, <laughs> so I hope to, like, get something of that in that actually there are a lot of pathways that don't, we don't see where the bend curls are out to. Yeah. And the, the, the story that's told by the track is almost like there's like a levelling up almost, isn't it? It's like a character who suddenly becomes able to see things in a dimension that is much more than basically luminous. That's the thing that sort of happens towards the end. I notice it's like, yeah, it's like a Tory's what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should have that on the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that so, like, what um, filmmakers were you sort of thinking about? Because I know... Watching it, I noticed a couple of bits where I was like, oh, I might Well, Rich and I both like really bonded over Thai filmmaker Apache Pong, Beer Rust, Cool. I think that's about right, actually. Yeah, I've got that. That's yeah. um, <laughs> you can pronounce it, so go um, ahead. Anyway, but he's brilliant, and like, we both really love him, and are we just follow, like, we like how he can create a lot of. It's just slow and there's lots of space and time and it's very dreamy and you can kind of go into a bit of a, you can lose yourself and get a bit <coughs> funny while watching these films. Um, so I think that um, that was definitely like the thing we both said, or you know, like, oh, it would be nice to have that kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Um, and then also there's a film called... Um, Hard to be a god. I'm not saying that is anyway like it, but, <laughs> but you know, like just the feel that you can like it was very like you can feel it, you can smell it, and it was like you know that kind of thing. Um, it goes back to the sort of medievalist aspect as well, doesn't it? That yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what else you used to Maybe you mentioned like Flight of the Navigator. Flight of the Navigator. Tarkovsky films, I think you. Yeah, still. Uh, yeah. Um, just like where, basically, wanted no, just no one around, and then anyone who's around who didn't know if they were aware of Richard or not, or if they were aware of each other. And it was kind of again like a video game dynamic. Yeah, like that's when you I have mean, like the non-player characters that you yeah, and you know when you have like past, you know, you know, in games where you have glitches where. I always remember in like FIFA and games like that where the, you, for some reason the player would just be like running into the water. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be like, yeah, it would be like, and so that cricket bit, I guess, is a bit like that where Richard's glitching out, maybe, glitch, yeah. you know, and all the other guy is sort of glitching out. And there's other moments in there where you can sort of see it as being characters from video games, just for virtual reality. Yeah, you know, having their little weird moments. Mm. And the two, the two realities basically interacting with each other yeah. and each other almost. Uh, yeah. Creating a different kind of tension. Yeah. When I was about 19, I had a, a PlayStation 1, which we mentioned the yeah. FIFA glitching. Yeah. And it was uh, the game glitched in such a way that a little, like, shadow man just appeared, <laughs> but he was running like, uh, if all the old men are like running like this, he was like, <laughs> and he was just tackling the ball, and I was so horrified by this. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know whether I was like, drinking wine in my bedroom or something like that. Uh, I was just like, what? what's happening? And I ended up like 30 mil in there. But having this weird little, and it never did it again, and I was really freaked out by it. <laughs> I think that's a very good question. PlayStation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we see if anyone's got any questions from the audience? Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Any hands straight up? Obviously. Oh, uh, gentlemen in the public. Yeah, uh, I love the film, but it's, it's a music-related question. Sorry. Uh, just any, anything that you have to say about how you recorded what we listened to was there anything like? I mean, the, it all sounds amazing. Like, uh, how, where did you record it? I mean, like, was there anything special that you done? Know, just kind of sound it. Yeah, uh, we recorded at Bank Studio in Newcastle, which is the studio that was 
started by Sam Grant and uh, a couple of others. They moved from a uh, place next on well, Biker Bridge to a uh, place next to the new Star and Shadow, which also moved from Biker Bridge. Um, uh, what to tell you about it? I mean, I know, I mean, Sam was really excited because it was the first time, maybe second time, he got to use this robot with a mic on. So, so it was like a mic on a frame and literally we could sit and control it to mm -hmm. decide how the guitar sounded best. So that was quite exciting. We wasted half day on that. <laughs> it was the first time I recorded with a, with a drummer, um, Andrew Cheatham. So that was, that was a new thing for me. So yeah, we just we just adapted the guitar and the drums together uh, over the course of three or four days. And then pieced together the best takes from it before we done. Which was I think like the hermit was uh, pieced together from a probably three takes of guitar and drums. I think thicker than water the second track was one take. Um, I can't remember how it went. And then, then we just built One thing that was really exciting to me was working with Anne Harrod uh, on violence, Anne Harrod Davis. Because uh, we were trying to do, we were kind of trying to build them up, and, and it was only half, kind of a few hours in, I realized I could just sing a melody uh, and she, would, she could just play it instantly back without it. It was so wild. I was like, wow, we can do it this way. So we ended up just do, doing the arrangements for the all the strings on the album over I think three, two and a half days of me just going like <laughs> Something, uh, something, something good for them. And 
then when we sort of suggested uh, about the film and sought James's reaction to it, is the things he, the kind of filmmakers and, and things he mentioned uh, in response to the song were were like, oh, yeah, he's he gets it. Like one one of them was a picture by Wee Wee Yeah, uh, who's this amazing director who made films like Tropical Ballady and Uncle Boomy who can recall his past lives and some other great films, Blissful Ignores and the book. And uh, he, that was the first filmmaker he mentioned and you know, email back and it's like, boom, this guy. <laughs> um, and some other things like uh, some Tarkovsky films and uh, I can't remember what else. How to be a god. Oh yeah, he mentioned, yeah, how to be a god. And how to, how to be a god ties in with the sort of the, the, the sort of medievalist um, atmosphere. And I think it was more the, that one. I think it was more like just the sort of grimy. Uh, well, not grimy, but like kind of. <laughs> you could, yeah, textured. I, I, initially, I was thinking of like everything about like people making things and like, you know, like, yeah, very much focused on the textures and stuff, mm. the tracks, and that's I guess that's. Really, it's interesting because um, the, the music has a very particular texture, particularly in the beginning, there's a, there's a tremendous sense of tactility and space to the way the music unfolds, particularly in that opening section. Um, was that something that you were aware that you were trying to do? Yeah, yeah, that was my first instinct. It was like, first thought was like, oh, it's just like it's being made. And it felt like it was not from now. And I wasn't sure when exactly it was, like whether it was from the past or the future or whatever. But you know, it's like I, want, I thought about people watching other people making things, and it was leading to something more interesting. And that feeling of like, what's going on here? It's a bit of a mystery. That's what I was hearing when I had the track for the first time. So definitely wanted to get that. So then, presumably, you got back to Richard with the ideas that you'd had, and then it was a case of, is there a lot of ideas? Did you winnow them down into sort yeah. of a workable two or three, or what, how was the process? Yeah, it was like loads of different stuff, stuff that didn't make sense, stuff that made maybe a bit more sense. I mean, the track is like, the, you know, it's like a big thing. So I was, it was a bit of a job to sort of, I don't know, like, I kind of made sense in my head, but I had to present it to people to sort of, to win the moment, but, you know, yeah. like, to make it and everything, and then, and then to film it, and of course, to be in it. Um, but then, it, again, in the edit, it was like, you know, like, I had all these moments, these things, like, how do I tie it all together, how do I make it flow, and just, yeah, it just, I just went on instinct, and, you know, kind of followed Richard's lead with the music, you know, you always, if you're making music videos, you kind of always have to, you know, it's all about doing the song justice, doing the track, you know, and the artist justice. So, as much as this is like, you know, I guess it's like a bit different to a music video, I'm still following that rule in my head. It's like, don't want to don't mess it up for the artist, don't want to like ruin it, so I have to keep true to like the song and make sure nothing overpowers the song. Because that's. Because Richard's lyrics are like, they're incredible, they're like startlingly imagistic. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you take take any line in isolation, there'll be something that's very visual. Yeah. I think you, you write very visual when it comes to lyrics. There's a lot of interpolation. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of interpolation of <laughs> the natural world. I've beer on my nose. <laughs> 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 But how, how do you, when you're faced with the specifics of a very imagistic lyric, how do you, well, I do you put away from it? No, I yeah, completely ignored it. I, I, just, I didn't want to get involved. I, you know, I said before, I didn't really want to try and illustrate what Richard was trying to say, what he was saying. So I kind of like, and sometimes it just so happened that it kind of like leaked up sometimes, you know, sort of like floating around. It's, I guess it's up for the audience to figure out whether it would be worked or not, but that was my best version of how I could work with Richard's. 
And were there any, like, Richard, were there any occasions where you saw something that James was doing and were like, we're going in the wrong direction, this isn't what I want, or uh, was there a push and pull between... Well, we mentioned before, uh, there was a, one of the suggestions was that I will milk a cow at some point. <laughs> 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 Actually, it is something that I would like to try. It's not a great take. I would have got a great take. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't think there was much really noise. But I think in the. Uh, we sort of, at the start, we've exchanged a lot of ideas, and then I really just wanted to leave James to it. like. I feel like my best make of videos is like a, it's all, it almost feels like a necessary evil and I don't, I don't like feel like I put so much work into the albums and then you have this thing which is like uh, sometimes it's almost like you know it's coming after inevitably the thought is coming after the the, the real thing you have the impetus to do. And I realized, like, well, this isn't the energy I'm bringing to the process. So the, the th instead of trying to make it myself, l last time with uh, jogging, got Edwin to make this. And it was like, oh, okay, I'll tell him my simple idea. Just keep it really simple, do this one thing. And that's all. It doesn't interfere with a song. It just delivers it. Um, so it was just the idea is just to find the right person and, yeah. and hand it over. And so, yeah, with, with James, it was just, uh, I think, maybe the word... Wrong person. <laughs> the right person. And right at the end, uh, maybe we worked a bit more closely on the very yeah. specifics yeah, was, of the edit. But the fine-tuning, Richard and I did some edits to get uh, edit sessions to get one too. Mm -hmm. We've never done before, which is interesting. Nightmarish. Nightmarish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with our internet connection. Right. My computer was like really slowing down. Well, you got all the under the weight of it. <laughs> but our spiritual connection was <laughs> very noticeable in the backstage area. How close that spiritual connection. <laughs> <laughs> that was a beat to backstage. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that piece is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the um, the sort of the themes of the video, um, I, read, I read a quote by you uh, earlier today, Richard. Where you said um, in interview with Quiet, you said uh, just by being uh, excuse me, just by virtue of being human, you're in a number of different places at once. And I think there's something in the video that's very much about the sort of interstitial state. Of like how you find yourself floating between uh, reality and between fantasy and different influences coming in as you basically just go through the day. Yeah. And that, that's something that seems to be in the song as well. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I suppose, like, on a very uh, like close level, I don't know, was it macro, micro? I can't remember which one it is, but uh, like right now, I'm sitting, I'm trying to focus on what you're asking me. And I'm also <laughs> at this level, but then it was this thought of the wider room. I'm aware of my body in these trousers and this shirt. Same. Yeah, well, well now I You're aware of my body <laughs> in your trousers. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but as well, I, I'm, I have this. Worry. Um, there's something I'm worried about at the minute, so I'm I'm kind of partly over here, and then a different thing I'm worried about, which which is a newer worry, which is a bit more. Well, this is over here, and then I'm thinking about getting the train tomorrow, and so I'm imagining myself there. So he, so right there is a, a way, but then also in what I was thinking about with the album is like uh, you know where where I spent a lot of time. With it. Not a lot, a lot of time, but I really like video games yeah. now and again, not all the time, but uh, like uh, and then thinking about virtual reality, how it's ended our home for the first time in a kind of real way, even if it's still a bit ham fisted, shocky. A little bit shocky, but it might very well could get better a lot quicker, but quite quickly, sorry. Um, 
So that's another way that we can like step out of this so-called real world. But then I was thinking a lot about that like, with the news and the, some of the politics and the strategies, which are really forms of language magic, where people are using slogans, and slogans, what's the slogans, slogans. So all of this like unreality that we're having to deal with it just in normal life, picking through the news, the different ways, uh, you know, uh, Daily Mail versus how the Guardian reports the same story versus uh, Independent and the, and the Sun can all talk about the same thing as if it were a completely different event. Um, and I don't know. Uh, it's too late to be thinking about these things. It's past 10 o'clock. <laughs> all of this in the mix, like, uh, and why? Why wouldn't we want to uh, sort of? Why it's a kind of natural impulse to want to get to somewhere else uh, from this fantasy world that we're in uh, to somewhere that maybe is a different, maybe more palatable or. Digestible kind of fantasy it makes a lot of sense because it's interesting the, sort of the, the references in the video that are to a very sort of um, I would call quite a specifically British type of fantasy, which is that sort of um, you touched upon it in peasant as well, which is that sort of um, medieval almost the idea of a sort of medieval traveler, and you see that in everything from Lord of the Rings to the Legend of Zelda. Do you know what I mean? And it's very much this sort of single icon character moving through a world, you know, and that's something that I guess you had to sort of pick up on. Yeah, but I mean, Rich and I both definitely didn't want it to be, sorry if it came across medieval, but like we weren't <laughs> thinking white or medieval, no. but um, yeah, some kind of traveller figure from I mean, the time we don't know. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is like, it's, I guess it's like, yeah, people from who knows where, you know, and they're kind of like, don't know why they're there. They could be completely different characters. It could be and these these two senses, these two different states of reality, sort of fusing together, and yeah. sort of influencing each other. Yeah. Yeah. And um, quite like, but also it's there's like elements in there. I think that it could be it could be seen as like uh, dreams or sort of imagination, alien thoughts, or something. I don't know. It's kind of. I guess it's quite funny. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, there's a there's a there's a very specific energy to the video about the way that these um, the quotidian sort of more normal aspects of it feel like they're intruding on the fantastical elements just as much as the other way around. I think that there's a sort of they're both sort of given equal importance in a way that I think actually kind of very much is about the sort of situation we found ourselves in today, when you can be spending like you know five hours a day on Skyrim. And three hours a day looking at the news until you know something that yeah. hours a day. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still getting over slow goes. So. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, what sort of um, influences were you thinking about when it came to put starting to put it together? Um, so, you mentioned Tarkovsky. You uh, a picture. Oh, a picture. <laughs> a picture while we were at the club. Okay. Yeah, um, he goes by just Joe. Joe. <laughs> okay, that, that's helpful. So, what sort of things were you thinking about when you when you came to putting it together? Was it you've got this song? I presume it was a, it was a completed song that you were given. Yeah. So, what's the first step that it takes when you think, okay, so how do I start putting images to this? How do I start sort of realizing what goes with what? Um. <laughs> it was quite scary at first, so I was like, yeah, well, that's how it was. It was a reconstruction of what I went through. Like, say, two weeks later, um, <laughs> um, no, just like, just 
I had to be, I had to just go for it. So I was like, right, okay, I'm imagining this hospital scene, I'm imagining this waiting room, I'm imagining this, like, climbing these terrain. And Richard did bring up things that he thought, oh, I should be flying at times. And I was like, brilliant, how are we going to, how are we going to get Richard flying in these landscapes? It was like, like, what do we do? Are we going to do a green screen? Thing? No, no, we're not going to do a green screen. <laughs> it doesn't work. That would have been great. I mean, it, it would have been funny, but so, so like, okay, right, let's drone it. And let's do that and let's make it. So with the drones, it's supposed and that sort of movement, it's supposed to feel like for me, someone travelling between scenes on a game or mm. something, or you know, like you know, when you go, quick, go over there, you know, like yeah, and you're sort of like. Yeah, and, and that's what that's supposed to be like. But it's, I don't know, like, I can't even remember what how I went about it. It feels like a bit of a, the whole thing feels a bit of a blur, to be honest. It feels like the film was a bit of a blur. Um, I don't know, it was a, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Maybe someone else did it and I just sort of like, <laughs> But it's interesting, we were talking in the earlier um, Q&A, Richard, you were talking about how um, mistakes very often led to new places of competition, new places where you could think about stuff differently. Um, when you're using something as precise in some ways as the editing process, is that something that comes into play? When you'll be playing around with the film, something that you're completely oh, not to make Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's my favourite thing about making stuff. It's like, you have these ideas, go and shoot them, random stuff will happen, mistakes or brilliant little surprises that you never could possibly plan, beautiful little moments, capture those, then position them next to something else. It's all about like just sort of plonking things together and going, can that, like how does that fit alongside that, how does that make you feel? I'm watching stuff thinking, does that excite me, does that make me feel uneasy, you know, like with the music, obviously with the music, it's like, you know, like, is that, how is that, you know, what happens when you put that next to that, on top of that music. So it's a, just a case of doing what you think's right, and then, and then occasionally you'll just do something random that will make you feel work, and you'll be like, okay, well, I'm just going to stick with that, or it'll change your direction of what you're thinking. And, um, yeah, it's all a bit of a... Because did it, did it change direction a lot during the... When you were yeah, very yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I knew the things I knew I wanted was the bit where Richard's singing on his like just on his own. I knew that had to be on his own in like a cave, or when we were talking about when we decided to do the VR stuff, like in a sort of VR space. You know, like just him on his own. Didn't want him facing the camera while he was doing no vocals to the camera at yeah. all. You know, that was definitely a thing. And uh, that, that was definitely a thing. And I knew there was going to be this recurring duck goose figure thing. Because <laughs> I'm a big fan of ducks. <laughs> that's why that's like, I was a bit Yeah, um, and I knew there's certain yeah. things I thought could be happening. But no, I'm always, I'm led, always when I'm making stuff, I'm always led by, you know, I just mainly do the so I'm led by the track and the artist. And I've got respect. I think it's probably a tough brief as well because I'm basically saying please don't illustrate anything that's happening in the song. So you have to avoid, you know, I mean, well, that is one way, just don't listen to the lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very smart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, just not to, how do you not, how do you, how do you help the song across without uh, interfering with it? It's a really fine balance. It's like a poetic resonance, isn't it? You look at the things that sort of resonate off each other without necessarily yeah. explaining what the number is. It's just like occasionally just it's just like weird little things happen. Like Richard, I don't know if you remember when we were walking down East Street in Bristol and we saw this did we film that before you actually did jumped on that um, guy's farmers I can't remember which way it happened, but you he sort of saw this sort of graffiti of like uh, Oh yeah, no, that was before and then, then 
later on though was on the back of the Yeah, head. like it was on the back of more pedal. He recreated that moment. Yeah. Yeah. It was like it was like we had happened, you know, we could have planned that. Uh, and, so. and you're dealing with something of that scope, I guess you yeah, well, I think the most important thing as someone who makes stuff is to just accept that you're gonna get given all this like cool things, all these cool things and random stuff. And you can just like, and then your job is to like go, oh, that was weird. Like, let's put it into the thing. Rather than just go, that was weird. I'm sticking to my plan, so which like is a, some people are so, yeah. so, I know, I've worked with loads of people, actually on this, on this film as well, where they're <laughs> uh, obsessed with the actual timetable and the plan. They don't give any time to like random occurrences and like beautiful accidents. And they're the things that are important. You need to be a wrangler of the random. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, that's, that's a nice uh, slow goal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's similar to what you were saying about how the music comes together. That there was a sense, there's a sense of when you were working in, this, you know, in the previous year, you know, when you were working in the about the idea of accidents becoming, uh, becoming the, the most important. It feels like so, this is the same one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think what, somebody asked a question about, um, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I told this story about something that happened to me when I was a younger musician, which was uh, I had like five gigs coming up in the Northeast, and this was the most that I'd had any it was the most I'd ever had in a, in a month period. And about a week before the first one, or no, it was maybe a little, it was, it was a bit further back than that, maybe a month or something. I, I, was, uh, I was outside of the pub at three in the morning wrestling with a friend that's new. <laughs> and I broke my little finger, had it in a, uh, just like put it in a splint or, or whatever, hoping it would be better by the time the shows came to run few days before it said so basically it's, uh, it's completely shattered each knuckle uh, so they had to put in a Suzuki frame which is named after the the uh, guy who invented it and it's like a, it's a, a uh, not the uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so it's a uh, metal goes through each knuckle and then the thing comes out here so I couldn't play guitar, so I had to figure out. I was really upset about this because I thought I can't do these gigs. But then figured, you know, <coughs> I could do the gigs. I could do about four songs by putting it in the open tuning and learn them on like two fingers, really awkward with this <laughs> metal thing getting caught. But it was still, I still did gigs. I ended up writing the two or three songs in this tuning. Uh, and then it was like, oh, they, they were pretty good songs. So I wrote some more, and then Finger was better, and I was just stuck in that tuning for forever, for, till now. <laughs> and this, like, thing, this, what seemed like the end, uh, turned out to be this very strong beginning. For, for me, it was like a, like a total game changer. So, yeah, I tried to remember that one. Similarly discussing more of these. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we have a couple of questions? Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? There is a gentleman in the basement. Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, I want to say it's a beautifully sung track and beautifully, beautifully written. But it's also beautifully edited and filmed, I think. My question really is to James, because I've seen quite a lot of his stuff, and it, it seems to be quite unlike anything you've done before. I don't know if you agree with that. Did you become a, a different kind of filmmaker when you were making this? Because it's not your usual sort of wacky, animation y, fast moving film. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I. My thing, I like to think my thing is that I don't have a thing, like I haven't got a spy or whatever. So I, I, I can, I, I think I can adapt to any artist and work with any artist or style or whatever. So, so yeah, I have, I mean I have done some like stuff in the, but, uh, I guess I have, I, yeah, no, like I'm open to whatever, I can do whatever. 
feels from outside. That's not the It feels like personal, basically. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of you. I can put, like, yeah, I think I'm quite able to just change, change it up and put different hats on to work with different people and get into their worlds. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Get a new song in, someone says, can you do this? Okay, right, here's the song. Jump into that world, listen to, get to know that person, and, and sort of do that. And then, I guess, yeah, I guess, like, the people will come back again. You get the dark, you get the views. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, yeah, so, yeah. I don't know, yeah, but I really enjoyed it. Like, it was my one of my favourite things I've ever done, because it's really nice to have a bit of space, time, and just, like, not sort of have to hit certain, you know, with music videos you're always hitting, like, beats and lyrics and stuff with this. It's like, so I want to make films eventually, so this is kind of like a nice bridge between music videos and films, so it's kind of... And did you plan for the sheep to follow Richard? Was that nice? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was lovely how that just sort of happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't really believe it was going to work, and the, the woman who owned the farm uh, just told me if you could walk away and just say, Yeah, she could be. There were some like, there were some horses that were quite scary, weren't there? Like, we weren't so brave we around the horses. That, I mean. Yeah, you would find Sadie and me walking right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be fine, they're, they're sure of me. <laughs> Stuff to me kind of rings with this like folklore quite rural imagery and um, I was kind of wondering what the spark was for you going down that path in those sort of musical styles and that that imagery really like what sparked that off was that part of your upbringing and stuff that you saw around you or was it something later on that triggered that preoccupation? Yeah I've definitely been drawn to it I mean I, I think Present was obviously that, and then uh, 2020 was very much not that, um, and this one sort of is again. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the next one won't be. <laughs> <laughs> next one's all about like <coughs> the ins and outs of, of uh, I don't know, like um, moving house. <laughs> so I definitely um pulled there sometimes but the, I mean the, my first thought about this album was uh, that because it means my partner Sally moved about nine miles out, out of Newcastle to a, a little former mining town which is quite rural it's kind of on the edge of civilization but I sort of just thought maybe the album could not be anything big overarching theme no not like I've done the last few times and it'll just be very simple songs about the woods and details of grasses and wind uh, but as I started thinking about it, the music suggested other things. Yeah. Um, and it became quite a bit more complicated. Um, but maybe in the past, I think we used this like vernacular of certain things which are veering towards like tropes of English myth. Yeah. Just, I mean, there's lots of reasons for it, but maybe in my thinking it's something about like I know I know when I'm peasant it was when there was this real like anti-immigrant thing which we have again now this is really stirred up to boil it was stirred up to boiling point I think that's an expression uh, it was the same time uh, that we were kind of blaming all of the country's problems on uh, things other than what were the problem and uh, Part of, you know this idea of a great Britain harking back to all of this wonderful time which never really existed. And uh, I think this this idea of the old Albion is kind of linked with 
that sort of, sort of help. It's sort of impossible to. I'm not a very succinct speaker. No, no, Sorry, okay. but, yeah. Um, but it's, there's no way. It's so impossible to say it in a short space of time. I, I don't think I could even say it in a long space of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, gentleman there. Yeah, um, just off the back of that, then, is that the reason why you have stuff like, um, there's a lyric in there, something like, there I was a fisher before I was forced to flee, uh, in jogging you have the Kurdish family on the ground floor get brick through their window, and then uh, the first song of yours I heard, Soldier, uh, from Tazzy, which, like, is that why there's always these kind of, like a hint at these people suffering and stuff like that, why it's not like, yeah, there's that romantic myth, but it's often like coupled with everything's kind of going wrong for some family or some person or something. Well, in, in the instance in jogging, I think it was think well, like, why, why is this person in the song concerned about that? Because they're a very, because they're a caring person and uh, but how does it, it, why it's in the, 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 there's lots of reasons why it's in the song, but the primary reason is, is because that person was thinking about it, because it bears some uh, relevance to their own life. Like, uh, yeah, uh, who I imagine that person to be would have been really affected by that. Um, so, primarily it was to tell that it, you know, it's, it really just touches on that family and then moves on, but it's really, the lyric is really about the, the person who's singing the song. Um, I realise that's a kind of obscure sounding answer. <laughs> um, but you, 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 you're grappling with a sense of perceived identity, and again you're dealing with this idea of influences coming in from outside that perceived identity as well, like the unreal and the real. In a, in a chain that perhaps isn't obvious. Like you've talked about the idea um, within your album that, as you said, there's no straight edge. You know, that, the, that everything is sort of billows out. The understanding of the idea billows out from a central point rather than just being a straight edge. Yeah, I think I could hit on this. I, uh, it was just like a way to say how because uh, I'm visually impaired, so I don't have like a solid edge to how I see physical stuff, and I sort of felt like that maybe leads, helps lend to you sort of think a bit more blurry, um, perhaps, maybe that's just a way for me to deal with yeah. my visual impairment a bit better, put a positive spin on it or something like that. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's hard about the lyrics, because there's never like, there's never one reason for it to be there. But definitely the primary one should always be that it serves the, the person who's singing the song. Yeah. It's character. It's character. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Uh, gentlemen, no. Um, this is sort of the song, but there was an interview ages ago that you did about Nothing Important where you talked about getting a lyric wrong and it really frustrating you but then also you talk often about like like you keep things blurry uh like mixing up a being like this particular instance was wrong but also it's quite blurry and like there isn't a particularness to it it seemed like a weird like i don't know could you talk about that <laughs> <laughs> Explain, explain what's going on. <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting area. I think in the interview I was probably talking about frustrations with particular word choices, and I have one with this hermit song, and it's a really small one, but it's uh, clung, clung, it sings clung to the fringe of the North Sea, and it's just a double verb. It should be in your fringe. And it sounds like a small thing. But honestly, it's such a simple, and it's just I've missed it. Mm. It's not that uh, 
it's not that it's bad or it's a mistake, it's that <coughs> I wouldn't have done it like that okay. had I caught it. And it, it's just slipped through the net, and there's often something like that. But uh, in terms of like things being blurry, it's never that you uh, so it's, this is different from that kind of frustration. But you, you have to be. It has. It's really. It's, there's a right way. There's a right line or a right verse to say the thing in, in the right way. But the thing you're trying to say is perhaps quite blurry or contradictory. Uh, but that's why it needs to be just so. Um, that does make sense. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hello. Um, so, with the title of the track being The Hermit, um, and with the video being so um, wide open, and a lot of spaces in the video being very wide open, like the sea and the land. Um, that a deliberate contradiction that I've always liked, and I think the this thing, I, and I like going from really small to like massive. So there was quite a lot of things like the, the small little play ball and the sort of huge ocean stuff like that, and I don't know, really know why <coughs> you've not answered why, but I guess it's something to do with, you know, it's, it's all from just music and words that pick those I'd imagine there's a bit moments. of Stanley Kubrick in there as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, yeah, but it's kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just fun, isn't it, to like, play with perception. There are, actually, there's quite a few moments when like there's things that come in and kick, come in and out of focus, which is two different things. Like two birds flying, and there's two spiders' webs, and there's like there's two, there's double, and you're sort of like thinking about different. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that. But <laughs> who knows? I think that's the answer. Who knows? For me, I always like I have been in the film Boogie Nights, where he, uh, he flashes up with his name Dirk Diggler. I always have this, uh, my, my word is uh, like a contradiction, I really, and I, I suppose, uh, like, why, I've never really given much thought to why that would be my favourite word, but now I guess I'm starting to see, well, maybe you think that if you are I'm quite a, like, conflicted individual, <laughs> <laughs> or con or contrary, or contradictory. Why I would find a need to celebrate such a thing like that. Uh, so, and in the lyrics as well, I always like things to cancel each other out. But in terms of the, I don't think we ever had a discussion about wide open spaces versus the nature of a I think those kind of things like kind of get discussed. They're just sort of. Uh, like I've said before, it's all instinct and if stuff just happens. Like, obviously subconsciously when you're there making it and you're thinking, like, I don't know, maybe I just, maybe I need to think more about what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually think, I, I just work on instincts and I don't work, think too much about it. So, I don't know. But when you've got, you've got two people working on instincts, Sort of together, haven't you? Yeah. People sort of, and you're basically hoping that the serendipity of the way these things bump, bump up against each other yeah. makes a sort of greater kind of sense. I think if you overthink it, I think if you try and look for meanings and things, what do you like doing? Like, obviously, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I do, and I do think about stuff. But it's like, do I want to, like, kind of then sort of present it as like this is the best. Yeah, I think it's just like yeah, you just make it and then that's it. Um different to that.
Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> maybe the when the music appears, it's quite flat. Okay, it's the thing that the words are um, absolutely hideous to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the, like the, uh, the opposite of an instinctual process. Brutally ridiculous. Really awful. Yeah. <laughs> so then, how do you respond like if, if James presents you with something that cuts against the grain of your very deliberately <coughs> placed words? Is, is there ever a point where you're like, no, you're wrong? It's no, so ridiculous. I think there was some little particular there's shots there's where I was just like, this is not yeah. I, don't, I don't like I thought, that. And, and Richard's suggestions yeah. were bang on. Every time he suggested something, it was like, of course. I moved something, and it was like, yes. That is. Yeah. And he came up with. You know, there was very rarely, I mean, there were a couple of occasions where I'm glad stayed, stuff stayed in that he wanted out to do, uh, you know, like he wasn't so keen on certain the way things looked, but we ended up, and it was all good, wasn't it? It was a lama. Tommy hates lamas. But, um, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but no, the, no but generally, like, every suggestion which you made is, like, pretty much, like, on. And it's great, that's, you know, totally, as someone who makes stuff, it's lovely to hear, you know, I'm not a control freak, I love hearing other people's opinions and then sort of, like, thinking differently, you know, like, seeing from their point of view and then, you know, oh, yeah, that could, that could work better that way, you know, and it always does. Like, someone else should probably edit it and I should just <laughs> Sorry? Were you thinking in the car park? <laughs> in the car park. Oh, Snoozy there. I was going to say, it was in the film. Snoozy, if you can't see, was the lady in the car park. I wasn't thinking, was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? I thought you looked great, and I thought yeah, this is going to be a great moment, because you just appearing in the car window just for me, just looked like a great thing. <laughs> was that non pre meditated? Well, I think it's, it's do you suggest me as you think? I was you know, not really a bit. Or do it some John, with John, but, but, but Snoozy down there was the day from the car park, and um, <coughs> then when she was like approaching the car window, I was like, oh, this is good. This is like, <laughs> That's kind of. Well, I said to you before, I thought that's one of the best bits of the. Yeah, I like it, it's my favourite thing as well. Now, on reflection, I think it could have just been 40 minutes of things. <laughs> I didn't see it at the time, but the way I sort of see it now is like, after Richard talking more about games and things, is like, you know, like, so if you're playing a game for ages and then someone's like, come on, stop playing, you know, like, you know when you go to sleep on a game and it's sort of like, you go to dead. Yeah, you know, it's like that kind of thing. That's a lot of the sleep, sleep related stuff and things. I feel like it's all is that in that world. Yeah. So it starts coming together the more you think about it. I know, it, it is weird. Yeah, yeah, like the, now, now it does. <laughs> Didn't know what I was doing. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Anyone else? Hey, look. I'm sorry, we'll touch it in What video games do you play? Wow. Well, uh, did I talk about Skyrim already in this? Skyrim is in the last one. So that was 12 years ago, I, I, I had, hadn't played video games since I was like 19, 20, and then I, I played Skyrim and I couldn't believe how much the games had come out. So that was a, a really sad and amazing Christmas. Brilliant. And then more recently, oh yeah, after that, like Fallout. I love the I love the open world games where you kind of shape your own character. Um, and then I really loved recently uh, The Last of Us and Red Dead Redemption. I was I mean I was, <laughs> I was looking forward to Red Dead Redemption too so much that I told Sally about a year in advance. Like I just blocked out the calendar for two years. <laughs> Um, it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and what else? In fact, some of the games, uh, there was, there was uh, Detroit Become Human was 
very interesting, but there was an earlier game, Heavy Rain, who was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. James? James? No, no, absolutely. No, I, yeah, no, 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 I, just, I don't really understand it. And I actually, uh, a few weeks before we were shooting, when Richard told me about these games, I said, I wish I'd done it. And I was going to like have a big chat with loads of nerds about it. So it was just so nice in the studio. We're like this is really lovely. Um, hearing Andrew's drumming and Rodri and Ankara and their, what they were doing was just so like so good. Is so, there any way we can delay my singing for like <laughs> actually 30, 40 minutes? <laughs> um, but it, it was really the the only reason to to do it so long at the start was because it. Is telling the story as well. And this this section is for me is like the forest on idle, like the most basic functions, um, with maybe a little frond or an animal skittering across. Is just a little little something, um, and it was really necessary to to because it's quite a difficult to grasp story. It, 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 you also need to tell it through the structure and the, and the, the pace 
case of it, everything needs to also tell a story as well as the, as the words. Uh, was it hard for you to make something that's sort of like striving entirely for beauty? Um, because like a lot of your stuff, I kind of feel, like stuff like Glass Trunk and those older ones, like a lot of the, I think there are like beautiful moments in them, but it almost comes from the release of the darkness that comes before it, and it's the way that the two things intermingle. So was it hard to make something that was aspire, aspiring to be just sort of like a, a truly beautiful, not necessarily optimistic, but sort of like going for that style of thing without bringing in the darkness as well? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> no, it, it does, and it wasn't so much like, I think it was just like one of the first kernels at the, at the start, like, uh, particularly with like the end section, like this, not to, I don't need to push, like I've pushed a lot in terms of like the previous albums or the gigs, like singing loud and being, and actually go, maybe I can just not do that and um, have more space and room for light to shine through. And, um, I mean, if I could say, like, even hearing it back, it's just it's much on the beautiful. It's, it does sound so corny in a way, but I don't know, yeah, I don't know how else to put it. Uh, but it wasn't, once you get into the writing, you don't, um, <laughs> you don't, um, the story has to lead to, you know, wherever it needs to go. And then, then I wasn't thinking about beautiful, it's just what yeah. that There was a question from a gentleman about that. Yeah, um, Richard, James, thank you both. I'd like to say it's been a great evening. We'd just love to know the creative decision behind putting subtitles to the piece. It's really just an accessibility thing, but uh, it has an added bonus, I think, of making it look pretty cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember like, watching, like, you know, when you're 15, 14, you might have the telly in your bedroom for your first time. Uh, like, I don't know, like, when I got my telly in my bedroom, it was amazing. But the first thing I saw was Dangerous Liaisons. Oh, yeah, oh, bloody hell. But watching, like, Channel 4, some of the films that were on, like, Friday and Saturday night on Channel 4, and, and having never seen a foreign film, and you, ah, oh, this is just so cool, in the way, actually getting into, like, the different way to do the subtitles, or when they did the yellow text, italics, it just looks so cool, instead of, like, you know, the plain white aerial, which is on, like, a grey block, that's rubbish, <laughs> so, it's like a bit of a visual thing as well, I think it helps make images look really cool, but that's not the main, the main reason. Uh, one last question, uh, I think it's gentle, okay. um, talk about beauty in the, in the, um, in the song, there's also a lot of beauty in the in the visuals as well as the lyrics, but there's also a lot of humour in both the visuals and the lyrics. Was that intentional to have that that, that mix of humour and, and the beauty together in both the visuals and the lyrics? Both answers. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, yeah, definitely. I always like to have some fun stuff in, in what I do, and I think well, you know, Richard. Lyrics, as amazing as they are, they are funny. You know, a lot of the, there's a lot of the funny moments. So you know, there's a lot of like in the music, there's a lot of light sounding stuff where you know, like it sounds like you know something could funny could be happening. So you know, give add to it. You know, and then and I, I mean, and there's a few moments where I think I made the decision to like cut between Richard and. Um, you know, like, there's a moment where Richard's looking up and then there's a pig looking up. And, you know, that's supposed to be, I think, quite funny. But it's more like... But it's more like that, like, idea of, you know, just like, you know, just, I love, I, my favourite thing is plonking different things together and seeing what happens, you know, like, 
funny things together. See, see if there's anything funny. Or, or random or, or strange things together, or serious things. I'm just seeing what happens. And then there were funny occasions where stuff happens the music together with that gives it a thing. I don't know. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, with, uh, I, don't, I mean, I can't speak for the film, but for, in terms of like writing lyrics, I've actually had it really strongly on quite a where some of the words I knew they would be funny to hear, but often they were like in the most horrendous places, like they were, they were the funniest bits, but they were also the most awful things that happened. A bit of slug in the Yeah, no, exactly, and getting a kitchen knife in and you're going to stab your cheating boyfriend. It's, it's really horrible. Um, but, you, you know, get a giggle when you sing it. That's not, not no good reason to... There's not really ever a moment where I would write a lyric um, to be funny. Um, it's more the opposite, like, it will, if it is, if it seems like it might be funny, It'll usually give us a cause for pause, and I'll try my best to find something that isn't funny because it's like it's a. Sometimes it's fine, but it can be a bit of a distraction. I work on a song at the minute, and it's quite funny, I think. Uh, and it's like about about somebody with uh, I think about myself in my twenties, somebody who's not in a good mental place who has to go to loads of weddings. <laughs> and it's like there's a lot of funny stuff in weddings and things that happen with and, and all of the costumes and cakes and soft mad songs that people come out to. And, um, it's ridiculous. But you know, if you're in that, yeah. So uh, I forget that I've forgotten the thrust of the question, but but. Well, you're mixing like beauty and humour in, in the songs. It's an interesting combination. But it's like life is. It's. Yeah, I think you can avoid these things because in songs because they somehow don't have like a the feel like they don't have a poetic value or like a can of carlin or I don't know like singing about some everyday humdrum object. But actually it all does but there is there is something intrinsically funny about it, like singing about uh, I don't know, like a Reebok pumps for instance. <laughs> It's just funny to hear it sung earnestly. Really? <laughs> it's like, you have to, you can't sell that stuff, it could never be, um, it always has to be what the, what the person's going through and how they're thinking, uh, rather than trying to get a laugh. It has to, it has to serve the, the, the character and the story. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody.